We are the Childhood Collective, and we have helped thousands of overwhelmed parents find joy and confidence in raising their child with ADHD. I'm Katie, a speech-language pathologist. And I'm Lori. And I'm Mallory, and we're both child psychologists. We combine the science of ADHD with the compassion of moms and bring you practical tools you can start using today. So hit subscribe and let's help your family shine with ADHD. You don't want your child to struggle for years and dread going to school, but without an understanding of the school system, you are overwhelmed and confused about how to really help them. Luckily, you don't have to be an expert in school law to get your child the support they need, but you do need to know your child's rights and school terminology so you can be a confident advocate for your child. In our online course, Shining at School, we walk you through navigating the school system and identifying the right supports for your child with ADHD. From getting an evaluation to creating an IEP or 504 plan to knowing your legal rights and next steps when you disagree with the school. We have taken the most important information we would give you in a one-on-one consultation and broken it down into simple, easy-to-understand lessons. Wherever you are in the school process, we created Shining at School for you and your family. You want to feel confident and know that your child is happy and thriving at school. Head to thechildhoodcollective.com to check out Shining at School and use the exclusive code PODCAST for 10% off. You can also find the link and code in the show notes. Today, Lori and I are so excited to talk with Dr. Ellen Broughton, a widely recognized expert in the field of pediatric neuropsychological and psychological assessment. Dr. Broughton is the executive director of the Learning and Emotional Assessment Program, or the LEAP program, at Massachusetts General Hospital and an associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. She's also the co-author of several books and articles, including her best-selling book, Bright Kids Who Can't Keep Up. And today, Dr. Broughton is here to talk with all of you about her newest book, Bright Kids Who Couldn't Care Less, How to Rekindle Your Child's Motivation. Dr. Broughton, welcome. We are so thrilled to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And before we started recording, we were talking about how you're over in Massachusetts. Yes, I actually really wanted to go to, my husband and I really wanted to go to uh, Boston for graduate school. And I got into Northeastern and he was waitlisted at Harvard and did not get in. And we were so bummed, but we ended up out here in Scottsdale. So, but I've always wanted, I just love Boston. It is a great city. It really is. But it's, it's, the weather is terrible. I know. (laughs) It is the worst thing. I was trying to think of how to say that in a nice, kind way and not not put Boston down, but it's a fabulous city with terrible weather. You know, I feel like we, in Arizona though, we say that half the year, we're like, curse this place. It's so hot. My husband (laughs) calls it like a postage stamp of scorched earth. It's so hot. And then now it's like gorgeous here and we're like, we have the best life. (laughs) So everywhere has its ups and downs, I guess, but we're just really grateful for your time. And thank you so much for, for being here. Well, before we jump into talking about motivation, can you share a little about yourself and how you became interested in this career? So I became interested in psychology after being a special education teacher for seven years. So I became interested in special education because I have a, I have actually have a brother who has Down syndrome, who's an amazing uh, young I was going to say young man, uh, an old adult now, (laughs) fabulous. And so it kind of exposed me to the world of special education and learning differences. And then I was a special education teacher, early childhood, mostly early childhood special ed, and then went into psychology and was drawn to the area of learning disabilities and ADHD, which is what I did my dissertation on. And then as I was working with children and um, adolescents in the field of neuropsychology, assessing ADHD, learning disabilities, Mm -hmm. developmental disabilities. I saw a lot of kids struggling with processing speed, which was the the title of the the other book that you mentioned, which is really about how kids process information quickly or not. And at the time that I was researching that book, I kind of thought that, well, maybe it's maybe everybody who has slow processing speed also has ADHD and found that was not mm-hmm. the case. Many mm-hmm. people with ADHD do have slow processing speed, but uh, 
forty percent of them don't. And then over the last uh, five to six years. I became interested in this issue of motivation because mm -hmm. a lot of the kids I was seeing just didn't have the drive. And this wasn't just high school and middle school kids. It was even very young kids who just did not have sort of a purpose. They didn't know how to find that kind of joy in their life to keep them motivated. And so that was the theme of my latest book, which I started writing or started at least writing the proposal in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then the book became much more applicable to a wide range of people because yes. we're all unmotivated since yes. 2020. We're trying to all find our mojo. I know. So, um, yeah. I read in your book, I love your new book, and I I love that you talked about that. You're like, in 2020, what did you call it? Like the great demotivator or something? Exactly. Like, if that is not the truth, like, how many days can I go without putting on a pair of jeans? Really? It was, yep. it was a lot for everyone, kids and adults, but the, those kids in that adolescent years, that really, I think it was a huge impact on them. So very timely. Yep. Yeah. And and we have these phones that are so distracting <laughs> now to all of us that really, um, it's so much more motivating to get on and get like instant gratification from quick videos than it is to do the work we're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a symptom and a cause of low motivation because when I'm not motivated to do something, I pick up my phone and start to yep. through Instagram. And then because I'm on Instagram, I'm less motivated to do something. So I think it does have an, a big impact on us that we have this easy to manipulate thing right next to us when we're not, you know, when we, when we're just at that point, we're like, Oh, I should start this task. Mm -hmm. We wind up picking up the, up the phone. Yes. Yep. And for me, it's like I pick up my phone to, to check something. And the next thing I know, I'm like in my social media apps, looking at my email. And then I have to like talk myself back through it and be like, what was I actually doing before I picked up my phone? Why did I pick this thing up? It's really automatic and it's it's a little crazy. So I know that is that is a huge piece. So obviously our listeners, the vast majority of them are raising kids with ADHD. And so we know that motivation is a huge issue for so many of the families that we see and talk with. And parents are really desperate to motivate their kids. But as you wrote in your book, motivation is actually quite complex. So how do you define motivation? Well, the simplest way to define motivation is to just think at, at, of it as the reason why we do what we do. So it's the reason behind, and it could be, you know, there are lots of different, I talk about this in the book, there are lots of different kinds of motivators. Some are biological, like we're thirsty, so we're motivated to go get, get ourselves a drink of water. Or there are some things that are, are biological where we're, we're just instinctively drawn to do something. Mm -hmm. And then there are motivators that are extrinsic, meaning like somebody gives you an A for doing good work or you get paid for doing a job. And then there's also intrinsic motivation, which is really the holy grail of motivation. <laughs> it's it's the, that motivation that we have because inside of us, we want to do something. We want to accomplish something. And it's hard. This is not something that is an on and off switch. Motivation yeah. is a combination of all of these things. And as parents, you've got to sort of think about for what you want your child to do, what kinds of motivators are going to work for them in the, in, in a certain situation. Yeah. So why, why is it that you think that kids with ADHD have a particular challenge with motivation? A lot of the things that are common to children with ADHD are actually different words for motivation right, that we use, at least in, in our common language. Things like getting started on a task, initiating a task. Motivation really plays into that. You know, if you already have trouble with initiation and you don't have a reason for doing it, it's going to be doubly hard. Organizational issues are tough for many kids with ADHD. And when we're struggling with organization, again, difficult to get motivated. Think about if you have to clean out the garage in order to get the garage or the car into the garage, you know, you, if organization is difficult for you, that's doubly unmotivating for you to do. So a lot of those things that kids with ADHD typically um, struggle with also are problems in just general motivation too. Yep. That makes sense. And I think so much of it too is like, when we, there's kind of different parts of the process, right? So the motivation to get started and then part of it too is staying on the task long enough to get it done, but not overdoing it, right? And so a lot of times I think with parents, it's like, 
it's hard to even break down exactly what the challenge is. But when we really break down the task, it's like the getting started, the keep going, the don't get distracted. That's actually a lot of working parts for kids and parents. And when you understand, you know, those different models of motivation, I think that can be really helpful. And I think something else, when I was reading your book, I know a lot of our families get a lot of feedback that rewards are bad and that external rewards are going to just across the board, decrease your child's motivation. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because obviously we know from the research that it's more nuanced than that, right? It can't be boiled down to a social media post to say, never reward your child or they'll lose all intrinsic motivation. I think you did a really nice job parsing that out for parents. So maybe you could just explain a little more. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we, we, we tend to see things in black and white in whenever we hear a new study come out or something like that. So one of the things you want to think about is what are the sorts of rewards that need to be external? So I'm not going to show up for work if I don't get paid for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there are tasks throughout our lives that are extrinsically um, rewarded and think about in your child's life, what are the things where that's appropriate? It's not appropriate when it's a task that should normally be intrinsic, mo- mo- intrinsically motivating. Sorry, that's a mouthful. So it's <laughs> so when you think about like some of the studies that have been done on this were done uh, looking at reading in kids who were extrinsically motivated to read, they lost that drive to read. Mm. And it's because they associated reading with something that wasn't internally rewarding. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that they should be internally rewarded by, something that we all need to do in life, that is something that we should be thinking about intrinsically rewarding so that they should be reading at a level, for instance, that is rewarding for them. So if they're not if they're not wanting to read, we need to look at the level of their reading, the kinds of material they're reading, the, whether or not they have the skills to be a competent yeah. reader, as opposed to paying them to read. Mm-hmm. But there are other things where it is okay to give an external reward, where it is okay to say, look, your room is really messy, and I know that you're not very excited about this. I wouldn't be either, but it's got to be done. What can we do to make this rewarding for you? What can we do at the end? because that's what we do as adults. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when we have a task and sometimes what you want your child to, to learn from something like that is that, oh, it does feel good when you clean out the yes. closet. Like you, you wind up not giving yourself the reward for that because it is, it feels good. So you want to be able to give rewards that push your child, but don't take away their feeling of um, getting pleasure from a job well done. I mm-hmm. love that. And I, I know that Anytime we have guests on here, I'm always like, how does this apply directly to my life? And so an example of that, though, is with my son. He just turned seven, and I grew up in a very musical family. We all play multiple instruments. I learned to read music before I learned to read, and it's just been a part of our life. And so I have him in piano, and it is hard for him because he's not – He doesn't like to sit down. Once he starts, he actually sits there for much longer than I think he would, but it's literally the transition. Like we're going to sit down at the piano and anything else that he's doing, he's just like, no, I want to do this other thing. And I've tried it in the morning. I've tried it right after school, after homework, before we do TV. Like I've, I feel like I'm just, you know, doing acrobatic tricks to get this kid to sit down. But a part of it is I think that it's not internally or intrinsically motivating for him yet because he can't play a song, like an actual song, right? And so we're using some external rewards. Right now it's pretty basic. I'm not going to lie. It's a sticker chart and he just has to, he can draw his own like sticker, I guess. He draws, he's really into making check marks or whatever. So I'm not going to lie. I'm not like spending a lot of money on this kid's rewards right now. I don't want to make it sound, but it's helpful because what's happening is he knows he wants to fill in all those boxes and we have his recital is in coming up in a few weeks. And so he wants to fill in every day until the recital. And that's really for whatever reason, kind of an external motivator. But I think as he's getting better at playing his song, he's more intrinsically motivated. So, and I think you talked about this in the book too, where the as you are learning a new skill, something you know is going to be so valuable for your child, sometimes using those external rewards can be really powerful to get them over the hump, like you said. And then they notice their clean closet or they learn a new song and they're like, oh, this actually is actually intrinsically motivating. Exactly. And that's such a perfect example too, because it's not like you're giving him a 
you know, a car after each, <laughs> after each page. That's I mean, why I'm I exaggerating, clarified. of course, but you know what I <laughs> yeah. mean? You're not like saying, oh, if you practice for 10 minutes, you get 30 mm-hmm. minutes of computer time. Right. That's, that is, that's not the kind of, instead you're saying, I want you to concretely look and see about the progress you're making. I want you to see on, you know, realistically, concretely, here's what you're doing. And here, you know, at the end, you're going to feel this sense of accomplishment. So that's, you've really matched the reward. It's really not as much a reward as it is a check in with him, a validation of how much work he's putting in. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm hoping. Okay. I'm not going to lie. I was reading your book. I was like, okay, I think I'm on the right track, but it is, it feels scary as a parent to offer a word, a reward and say, well, maybe he's never going to love the piano because I'm rewarding it. You know, you kind of have that fear, but yeah. I think it's really important for parents to understand rewards are not always bad. There is so much nuance and so much gray to this and really thinking about it, like you're saying, can be really helpful. And the other thing you can do is to talk to your child about that too. You can sort of, you can say to them, because this is sort of where growth mindset comes in too, is to be able to say to them when we're, you know, when I, I want to make sure that I'm giving you enough support and enough encouragement to keep you with the piano so that you can decide whether or not you, you like it or not. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and you can sort of instruct them in kind of what you just said. Kids love to know how the brain works, how our motivation works, and, and to talk to them about that so that he can sort of evaluate that too. Mm-hmm. That it can sort of factor into that growth mindset where it's sort of like we're, at, we're always at that edge of kind of, you know, pushing the envelope of what we're capable of doing. Yes, it's such a hard thing as parents to know is, is my child resisting this because it's too hard or he really doesn't have a knack for it? Yeah. Or do I need to kind of push them a little bit farther to get them to a place where they can find that enjoyment? And I know that he might not be a classical pianist. He really mm-hmm. wants to play the drums. So I've said you need a little bit of foundational piano and then we can absolutely move you to a very loud instrument. Um, but we need to know the basics of rhythm or we're all going to go absolutely nuts having him just banging away on the drums. So yep. <laughs> it's for everyone. I went through this with my daughter where she, my husband loves soccer and he really wanted her in soccer. And we were like, well, it's just, she came in when she's older, she doesn't have the skills. And we kind of like pushed her to do two seasons of it. And she's now doing ice skating. And it's like such a drastic difference to see her motivation Mm -hmm. in wanting to learn and excel in in soccer, which is not internally motivating to her (laughs) versus the ice skating, which really is like, I don't have to tell her anything. She has intense focus when she's in that activity, Um, which we talk to lots of parents of kids with ADHD that are trying to find that what that thing that they're just really internally motivated for. But like you said, sports or those extracurricular activities aren't really something we would provide an external motivator for. We're trying to find what is it that they're internally driven to do. Which is actually, that's a perfect segue into the, what you talk about in your book, the parenting app, right? And that framework. Mm, So can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think that's exactly where we're headed in, in this conversation. So when I was researching, how do we get at this motivation? Like, how do we think about, how do we motivate a child who's really unmotivated? I looked at um, three different areas of, of, that are important to motivation and they stand for aptitude, practice, and pleasure. And that's where the app comes from. It's not a real app. I wish it was. It would be so much easier. I know it'd be so much easier, (laughs) but aptitude, or, or we'd all get distracted by the app too, I That's guess. Right. There's always that potential. <laughs> but uh, but aptitude really means looking at what your child is good at. And both of you talked about this in your examples of your, your you know, talking about your children. You critically are critically evaluate, you know, is this that she doesn't like soccer or she can't play soccer? And mm-hmm. it that if we don't always like what we're good at doing either. But we've got to first know, is our child competent in this area? And and that's a piece of it. If we are asked to do something that we don't have the skills to do or that we just can't do, physically can't do, we're never going to be motivated. So we've got to keep that in mind. Then we have to look at what gives my child pleasure. So the example of the ice skating versus soccer, maybe she's just great at sports. That's an aptitude. But the sport that gives her pleasure is ice skating. Yeah. And, and 
for a lot of kids who are really unmotivated, it's even hard for parents to think about what gives them pleasure. Yep. So it might take some really thinking about when is my child happy or when was the last child my last time my child was happy. Sometimes it's thinking about or helping your child think about what they're grateful for. And then the third part of that app, and if you kind of think about it as a Venn diagram and motivation is kind of in the middle of this, the third part is practice. What does my child tend to do when they have time to do it? So of course, that's going to involve actually having time to do things, Mm -hmm. um, to practice things, to be able to fiddle around with things and thinking about, all right, so what does my child tend to practice gladly? What are the things that they are good at doing naturally? And what are the things that give them pleasure? And these are not all one and the same. And for a child who really is having trouble with motivation, talking about each one of those, observing those sorts of things in your child, quantifying them can really be helpful at kind of figuring out what are the sorts of things that are going to be intrinsically and naturally motivating for my child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in your book, you have, you know, the Venn diagram, which anyone that doesn't remember like those science days, you're looking at like three big circles, right? And so right. you're putting in one circle, these are the things that my child has natural aptitude for. These are things they practice. And then I love how you actually wrote it out. And I think that could be a really fun exercise for parents and doing that, especially with their kids if they're a little older. Um, but even younger kids, I think, could get into that. What's something you really like? It makes you so happy. Um, and finding that that middle of where all three of those circles overlap, that's the ideal, obviously. It's a little tricky. I think exactly what you said, like some parents are going to say, oh my gosh, you know, my kid really struggles with um, – anything that's not video games. <laughs> so finding oh. something beyond that or using that as a jumping off point. Yeah. It's funny though, for a lot of kids, if you open a discussion like this, most of them don't say video games gives them a ton of pleasure. It might give them some, but it's even if they're playing a lot of video games, what gives them maybe pleasure from that is more about the interaction with other people hmm. than it is the game itself. It's sort of like if we, you know, even if you spend a lot of time on Instagram, it, it probably isn't at the top of your list of what gives you pleasure. Now, there are some kids who are big into TikTok and are great at it, you know, owning their own businesses at age 11. <laughs> but but for most of us, it, it's something that we do when we don't have other things to do as Mm -hmm. opposed to giving us pleasure. So opening up that discussion, and I've had many parents say to me, I don't even want to ask that question. Like, I don't want to ask them what gives them pleasure because what if I don't like what they, what they answer? Mm -hmm. So we've got to, as parents, really be able to say whatever my child says, I'm going to accept or at least listen to. That's so interesting. I think that is actually so much harder than it sounds. I think most parents listening would be like, of course, I want my child to do what brings them joy and what they're good at. I don't have any preconceived notions, but then I even check myself and I'm like, no, I think we all have ideas of what our child is going to be like, what they're going to be interested in. So it is just something to reflect on and and think about, you know, a little bit deeper. Oh yeah. We have dreams of our own when we have a child of what we want them to be. Like we want them, we want to coach their soccer team. We want them to be, you know, mathematicians. If we're math nerds, we want, we want them to be all of those things that we are and that also we didn't get to be. And it's a lot of pressure to put on a child. It can also be one of a source of of demotivation for them because Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot to carry. So we have to be aware of that too. Absolutely. It's so easy to deter your child, I think, from the things that they're maybe naturally motivated for just because it takes up too much time for us or we don't actually like the thing that they're interested in or it costs, maybe it costs too much money. Um, Mm -hmm. Ice skating is ridiculously expensive. (laughs) I know. Um, So is dance. But yeah, there there (laughs) are, I mean, there's certainly barriers though to to things. But I remember, you know, when I was in high school really wanting to cut hair and I remember my my mom was just like, you're not going to be a hairdresser. You're going to, you're going to college. And I'm like, I don't want to go to college. I hate school. (laughs) That is so interesting. So my like 
dream. Um, I would have been a cake decorator. I literally (laughs) am obsessed with decorating cakes, but my parents were like, there's no chance you're doing anything in the arts. Music, no. And we're so musical. But they were just like, no, that's off the table. My dad, of course, had a fine arts major in college. So they were just like, no, you can't do it. And they were probably helpful in that way. But I think it's very interesting how, you know, when we look back on our own lives, we can all probably find those moments. For my kids, the last thing they want to do when they get home from school is homework. Totally. And the last thing I want to do after a long day of work is deal with the stress of meal planning, grocery shopping, cooking, and cleaning up the kitchen. Same here. We tried Hungry Root Grocery Service to help us eat balanced meals while saving time and money every week. It's been a game changer for our weekly meals and snacks, and I love that you can customize groceries based on your kids' or your family's dietary restrictions. Yes, my husband eats gluten-free, and I love that I can customize groceries based on our family's needs. And not only can I get complete meals delivered, but I can also order my weekly groceries through them. And I'm always amazed at how my kids will try new things just because they came out of our Hungry Root box. Yes. It's easy to customize your box each week, and you can skip weeks whenever you want. For a limited time, Hungry Root is offering our listeners 40% off your first box, which is amazing. Just be sure to use the code CHILDHOODCOLLECTIVE40 so you can get the discount. We also have the link and the code in the show notes, so you can try Hungry Root today. One thing I hear from my friends is that their kids often think boring tasks like chores or homework are going to take forever, and in the same breath, their kids can play two hours of Minecraft and then complain that they just got started. Okay, I think that friend you're referring to might actually be me. (laughs) I'm not naming names. One tool we all love and have in our own homes is Time Timer. At this point, I think we all have multiple time timers. For kids with ADHD, time can be a very abstract concept, and time timer helps by making time more concrete. It helps kids visually see the passage of time. And it can prevent those inevitable meltdowns when two hours of Minecraft just wasn't justification enough to ask your child to complete five minutes of chores. (laughs) From homework to chores to screen time to daily hygiene to our own work, We love Time Timer because it is so versatile, and their designs are cute too, a staple in our homes. If you have a child with ADHD, we know you need a Time Timer, and we have a discount code for you to use. So head to timetimer.com and use the code TCC to get the discount. You can also find the link and code in the show notes. Obviously, the majority of our audience is going to be elementary age parents, but, you know, knowing that college is a few years off for them, I loved in your book how you explained the college application process and how that can really sap kids' motivation. So how can we kind of, can you explain that a little bit? And then how can we take that same premise and apply it to this age, like the school age kids that we're talking about? So, you know, you, the, the two examples that you've both given were perfect for thinking about this issue. Mm -hmm. What I find in the high school population is that that thought of going to college is frightening for so many of them that the only way they can say this to us is by giving up. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my practice in that age group is about helping parents and kids sort of realistically look at whether college is the right place. Now, I think in both of your cases, it's obvious that your parents said, yes, you could be a great (laughs) cake decorator, but you're probably going to be even better. You can always decorate cakes, Mm -hmm. but you can't always be a speech therapist or or psychologist. And so it's so it's really knowing your child, but you might also have a child for whom cake decorating would be a great career choice. So we have to get out of this thinking that every single child needs a college education. Absolutely. And and so, because I find that a lot of kids are demotivated and really checked out because of that. Mm -hmm. And so the things that I always tell parents to look for, and we can kind of apply this even in the earlier grades, did they fill out the application themselves? Do they want to do this? And it, it, terms of college, do they like to go to school and do they have something they want to do that is that they need to go to school for? And either one of yes to either one of those answers is fine. Mm-hmm. Like you can mm-hmm. you 
going to college just because you want to study English and you love English, that's a fine reason to go to, to college. And also going to college because you don't love school, but you really want to be a psychologist and it requires that kind of yeah. schooling, another great reason. But when both of those don't exist, we've got to find a different plan. Well, and and it's so, just, yeah. yeah, it's just so hard because you're in high school and I think most of the time, even if you have an idea of what you want to do, a lot of times that changes and shifts and so many kids don't know what they want to do. So there's not an end goal in mind of why am I taking all these classes and doing all these things? You know, when I was yeah. going to be a psychologist, it's like, well, I have to do that to be able to do my job. Yeah. Um, and I think those discussions need to happen like way before the yes. sophomore year of high school. And yeah. that's typically when they happen. We need to start thinking about there's and talking to kids about just adult, you know, what does it mean to be an adult? What do you want to, what do you want to do when you're 30 years old? Like when you're my age, what is your life going to look like? Those are the sorts of conversations we need to have with our kids when they're in third grade and fourth grade to get them thinking about what, what kind of an adult do I want to be? Because ultimately that is, you know, wanting and knowing where you're headed is an extremely motivating mm -hmm. kind of way to be. Yeah, it is. And I know you talked in your book too, about those kids that will say, I want to be a famous YouTuber who makes millions of dollars a year. And I think it's interesting. Maybe you could share your perspective on that. Cause I think as parents we're often like, great, sounds good. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you, what your recommendation is in those cases. Well, I don't want to like ever qu squash anybody's dreams for anything, first right. of all. But what I see more often than not is that there's a bad match between the, what the parent values and what the child values. So this can work both ways. You can have a parent who's like, ah, school isn't, who cares about fifth grade? My kid's going to be a tech guy and he's going to, you know, like most of those guys didn't even go to college. Mm -hmm. And so what does he need that for? Yeah, I want him to go to college, but grades don't really matter because he's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a lot of pressure to put on a kid. And most kids, even when their parents say you're brilliant or this or that, it, they don't usually buy it. Mm -hmm. They they just don't. They they have more of a realistic view of their own abilities than their parents do. So that can work in, in that way. The other way sometimes is a child actually is doing well. They have a sneaker selling business. They have something on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, and they're doing quite well. And the parents are like, I don't want them to do that. I want him to do this. Mm -hmm. And so they're not seeing the child that they have. So that's kind of the, the key here is loving the child you have, not the child that you wish you had. And that's where the, that's where the difficulties come in. And it can work either way. Either you've got a, a child just kind of doing their own thing and doing it successfully and you don't like that or mm -hmm. the opposite. Yeah. And after running businesses, you know, I can see so many people with ADHD just are, have a natural inclination to entrepreneurship. They just mm -hmm. really do and are um, good at seeing big picture and can really be driven in that way. And, you know, that's not a lot of times something that we teach in school. That's not something we focus on, even though it's like such a powerful way to have a career and make money in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it is like, I, I see so many kids, again, like at really young ages, having like this mindset, uh, this business mindset in the things that they're doing, even t making lemonade stands or mm -hmm. setting up dog walking businesses mm -hmm. at, at very young ages, like have this mindset. And yeah, it can really be fostered or, or, or not. Yeah. Yeah. And those sorts of things, if a, if you've got a child like that, that is a, an amazing thing because there are, you already know that they are motivated by work mm -hmm. and by responsibility. And we forget about how responsibility can be a motivator. We're always looking for that other sort of outside thing or, or inside joy, but, but kids love to be responsible. Mm -hmm. That's why some of those yeah. examples that you gave are intrinsically motivating because like, I'm like functioning as an adult right now. Mm -hmm. I am handling my own finances. I'm making money. I'm being responsible for something and I feel competent at it. And that's where a lot of kids with ADHD don't always feel competent in the day-to-day -day life of, especially in school. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 
If you could give parents one takeaway message for supporting their child's motivation, what would it be? Oh gosh, that's so. I know. So that's I, hard. I, 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 well, I already said the one about you know love the child you have, not the child you wish yep. you have. But I think that um, I think this issue of responsibility is is an important one to sort of think about um, the fact that a lot of kids these days have a lot of pressure, but not enough responsibility. So responsibility isn't about feeling pressured to get all A's in AP classes or to get all your spelling words correct when you're in second grade. Mm -hmm. Um, That's, that's a lot of pressure. Responsibility is, is taking care of others. It's being responsible for the things you're, you're able to do. So I think the more that you can instill that in your child, that sort of seeps out into other areas of, of, life and makes you motivated to do well in other areas too. Yeah. And we, I think for a lot of families, they see their kids struggling with those kind of daily life skills of they can't get ready in the morning and remember their water bottle. And so then they pull back on the responsibilities that are given in the home. And that makes kids feel not not useful. Um, They don't gain gain the feelings of success at doing certain things. And there's certainly chores or things that they could help out with in in the home that they could feel um, really good about themselves for, but don't have those opportunities because they do struggle in other areas. Yeah. And I have seen so many cases where young adolescents and older adolescents too get their first job and are incredibly motivated. And all of those executive function skills that we've been teaching all along the line are embedded in that first Mm -hmm. job, showing up on time, planning ahead. And, and also it's very, those first jobs are very clear, whether it's, whether it's mowing a lawn, a lemonade stand, uh, being a mother's helper in, in fourth grade for the neighbor's child, those sorts of things really build motivation. They build confidence and it real there. I really would say the more you can instill that in your child's world, the better. Yeah, and with a job, you can see if if I don't accomplish my role in this, this business doesn't function. You know, and it's very evident, right? Exactly. There's nothing like the executive functioning uh, of of being on time when you are the one to open up the coffee shop in mm-hmm. your you know your town or. You really, that's a lot of pressure, but it's manageable pressure. And when they're, when they're there, it's, it's so rewarding. So yeah, I've I've seen lots of unmotivated kids do fabulous in, in jobs. I love it. Well, Dr. Bratton, thank you so much for being here. All this expertise that you've shared, I know that our listeners are going to want to get more information, more knowledge from you. So how can they find you? How can they read your book? So my book is available from bookstores and on all of the websites, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. And also I have a website, ellenbrottenphd.com. And there are links to all of my books on there, as well as articles and and other kinds of videos and podcasts like this for more information about different topics. Great. And we will go ahead and link all of that in the show notes so that our listeners can easily find you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on today. We so appreciate you. Thanks for listening to Shining with ADHD by your hosts, Lori, Katie, and Mallory of the Childhood Collective. If you enjoyed this episode, please like this video and hit subscribe so you can be the first to know when a new episode airs. If you are looking for links and resources mentioned in this episode, you can always find those in the show notes. See you next time.